There's a trend. When tech founders stray too far from the mainstream path, they end up losing everything. Getting canceled and fired from their own company. The rise and fall of Uber itself. The technological accomplishments and legal battles it had to fight to get there, all before it came crashing down for the founder, Travis Kalanick. And it is also the company that I used to work at. So, before Travis Kalanick built up his savage reputation through massive holiday parties, got caught on camera cursing at Uber drivers, and a sequence of HR incidents got him kicked out from his own company, he brought Uber from zero to one of the fastest growing companies in history, reaching 50 billion valuation in less than five years. Do you know about the Uber story? The rabbit hole goes deeper because as of July 11th, 2022, a massive data leak revealed internal messages about Uber's hyper-aggressive growth strategy. It shows how Uber spent $90 million a year on lobbying that is paying for meetings with top world politicians and billionaires. Chess moves that allowed it to checkmate the rideshare industry for years to come, but we'll get into those details soon. So let's back all the way up to see how Uber hit this massive hot streak and seemed unstoppable for a while. Before Kalanick started Uber, Kalanick was fighting battles ever since he graduated college where he started a file sharing company called Red Swoosh First that almost failed multiple times over a period of six to seven years. This time period is when he developed his aggressive business tactics. Back in Red Swoosh, he used tax withholdings to pay for expenses, which is borderline illegal, and made sacrifices such as taking zero salary for three years and moving back in with his parents, which in his words, sucked because he couldn't get girls when he was living at home. After a lot of friction with his co-founders and investors in the company, he was able to sell Red Swoosh for 19 million, but he pocketed just 2 million on the deal. Using this money, he moved to San Francisco and started a Silicon Valley show style incubator right in his apartment. I'm not joking, it was really like the show and his apartment in the Castro district got a bit famous and even had its own Twitter account. This incubator house is how Kalanick met Garrett Camp, the eventual co-founder of Uber. Camp had founded and was running StumbleUpon, an app that brings you to random, interesting sites on the internet. And these guys both just hated the taxi experience, not just in SF, but across the world. And this is how they came up with a concept called Uber Cab. They started with a test run of just three cars you could book in New York City. And then after a successful pilot, they went for a full launch in San Francisco in 2010. Now, even in the first year, they had some trouble with law enforcement who said the name Uber Cab was misleading because they weren't actual cabs. And that's when they changed the name to just Uber. When things started to take off in SF, they realized they needed to grow super fast to get the first mover advantage in cities all over the US before other people took notice. And using his bold personality, Kalanick was able to get access to and close some of the biggest name investors and advisors, raising tens of millions in the first year of Uber operating and much more after that. They used this money in part to market and expand into new markets, but also to build a massive tech organization. Now in terms of tech, which is kind of what this channel is about, Uber is pretty much as complex as it gets in terms of technical challenges, but because it deals with the real world and the real world has a lot of complex moving pieces. You're dealing with matching people in real time, GPS, maps of the entire world, and a lot more. To build a system this complex, Uber used a microservice architecture, which means every little thing, for example, the rating system, is its own self-contained app that probably has its own team around it. This decentralized ecosystem allows you to scale your app into a massive size and keeps things modular where you can edit one little part of the app at a time. This also allows you to scale up and down your compute requirements. Now each service has its own set of servers which you can dynamically spin up and down. So for example, at the end of the day, more people are requesting Ubers. So naturally you're gonna need more juice. So you create more servers in parallel with each other. Also, if one of the servers fails, another one can just replace it. Now the system at large needs to handle, even for a single ride, hundreds of micro events firing. Now multiply all these events by every rider and driver across the globe at the same time. If you're the kind of person who gets excited about algorithms, you're dealing with utilization problems, matching supply of drivers with demand, balancing that out with dynamic, 
pricing in real time. And you're also using pathfinding algorithms for GPS like Dijkstra shortest path algorithm. And when you factor in multiple stops and multiple riders, you're also dealing with the traveling salesman problem, which is a notoriously famous algorithm. There are a lot of moving pieces here, which all fit into a transportation ecosystem. So if you think about it, Uber has more data than actually the government on this kind of stuff. Now that is a lot of tech and vocab that we just covered. So let's get back to the real world. Though Kalanick himself wasn't a tech guy, he was clearly good at choosing people because the tech team moved fast enough to launch the mega hit Uber X in 2012, which is the lower price option, which brought Uber to the mass market. And that is when things exploded. Just three years later in 2015, Uber was worth 51 billion. And that was when people really started to take notice. Lyft at the time, which had been also in the works for years, started to make a major push and get a ton of investments. There are also new local entrants into the market springing up everywhere around the globe. This was quickly turning from a blue to a red ocean, a hostile business climate, which some would say to survive, you need to be hostile yourself. Being in the spotlight, Kalanick's ruthless reputation also started to get into public as well. And he was extremely controversial in three different ways. First, he had a win at all costs attitude to deal with the competition in the business realm regulatory bans in every city, taxi driver protests, and competitors that shamelessly copied features. Travis ran things with an iron fist, expecting everyone at the company to work super long hours, nights, and weekends just to get the stuff done. He was known for spying on competitors, requesting fake rides, and creating pieces of software to mess not just with competitors, but also with government regulators that would detect who was a government employee and apply different logic to those riders. Controversially, Kalanick refused to add a tip drivers feature in contrast to Lyft, which wasn't helping his reputation. And more and more Kalanick started to be in the news for this kind of behavior, especially when an Uber driver caught him on his dash cam, who was complaining about the rates being too low. What? You dropped the prices on, on black. Yes, you did. Bullshit. We started with $20. Bullshit. We started with $20. You know what? How much is the mile now? 275? You know what? What? Some people don't like to take responsibility for I their own shit. Kalanick was also getting very notorious for toxic masculinity. With any hardcore hustle culture, sales organizations usually come to mind. Companies often try to create a winner environment that is extremely competitive, but it's not so common or taken as well in the tech world. So people started to throw around the terms bro culture or programmer when it came to Uber, which is something a lot of people hate. So what exactly happened that slapped the toxic masculinity label on Uber? Well, we're not talking about anything near Wolf of Wall Street level, but let's be honest here. Some executives did go to strip clubs and expense them on the company, though it's not clear how many times that happened. And Travis was just a bit too honest about his priorities. When he did an interview with GQ, he said he called Uber Boober because running the company got him so many girls. And then there was the Soul Karaoke Bar incident. We don't talk about that. In reality, it just added to the PR storm that there was a company event in Korea where there happened to be escorts present at the bar, but there's no record of anything more happening. Let's talk about some of the overseas challenges Uber faced and the moves Uber had to make to break down century year old taxi industries in multiple countries at the same time. Now, an internal executive probably put it best in 2014 when they said, we keep running into these problems because we're illegal. Is something with no established regulations illegal? That's a question up for a debate, but it's more productive to turn to those Uber files documents that I mentioned earlier. Here's exactly how Uber spent that $90 million a year on lobbying. We can see from this graph, Uber had over a hundred meetings with public officials in various countries in just two years. The CEO, Travis Kalanick, TK, was literally meeting with presidents of different countries. In one occasion in 2016, he was waiting for Vice President Joe Biden. Biden was running late and in a leaked internal message, Kalanick said, every minute he's late is a minute less he has with me. More interestingly, TK met with President Macron of France, brokering a deal with him directly where Macron would support French Uber drivers to be counter protesters against French taxi drivers. Again, in leaked messages, Kalanick said, it's worth it. Violence guarantees success. Truly some French revolution level stuff. The next thing is basically what made it all come crashing down. It wasn't until 2017 that things really hit the fan and all it took was one inappropriate slack message on top of all this 
I've been trying to get my girlfriend to try threesomes. Haha, ha, smiley face. This is the message a engineering manager sent to a new junior software engineer who just happened to be female. Whether this message was just uncalibrated and harmless or extremely creepy and weird, I guess it depends on your perspective, but it is clear how the person who received this message, Susan Fowler, felt. She immediately reported this to HR and HR did not take her side. They did not want to take action against this manager. So Fowler was absolutely outraged and wrote a scaling blog post about Uber and its toxic culture that went viral. This article got so big that later she went on to write a book about her life story and it was the catalyst for a full-scale investigation of Uber's company culture. And the investigation results, they weren't great. It turned out it resulted in dozens of room for improvement suggestions 25 people being fired in the company and Travis, well, this was the beginning of the end for him as CEO. The board replaced him with new CEO Dara Khosrowshahi, a career CEO and operator who came from the company Expedia. He was a safe, non-polarizing bet, a likable enough guy, but he definitely didn't have the same fire as Kalanick did. And thus began the age of Uber 2.0, where there was a clear before and after. This is right when I joined the company. I was expecting hardcore work, Jordan Belfort parties, and what I got was work-life balance. What the fuck? <laughs> what did people on the inside think? Well, there was a mixed bag of opinions. Some people thought Uber had to mature as a company and just focus on the incremental safe improvements to reach the next level. And other people said Uber is fucked without Travis Kalanick and it'll never be the same without him. You know why these eggs in the fridge have no shells? It's because TK hated peeling eggs. Dude was a legend. Soon after, we've hit 2018, the Uber IPO one of the most disappointing in the whole Silicon Valley. When you compare it to other companies, it's one of the very few that actually dropped significantly on the first day and first week. As soon as the IPO went down, TK himself sold 90% of his stake in the company for 2.5 billion. With that, he also resigned from the Uber board and he was out. Since then, Uber has been holding its position for sure, steadily iterating with small improvements, but there is still a clear before and after of the TK era. Here's a better and perhaps the most important question of this video. Without its savage culture, could Uber have gotten to where it's at? Emerging victorious in this cutthroat industry, holding on to a valuation five times bigger than Lyft, and dominating the market from the early stages to the present day. Is the toxic culture what got it there? Or was the culture just unforgivable and TK should just go down as a villain? You could bring up Google, Facebook, Netflix, who all succeeded while having a more run-of-the-mill culture. But keep in mind, the climate was very different for these companies, which were pretty much monopolies from day one when Uber had to claw its way to the top tooth and nail. So you let me know in a comment what you think. Was TK a complete villain? Since Uber, what has TK been up to as a billionaire? Well, he went on to open Cloud Kitchens, which is mostly flown under the radar as a B2B business. Probably better for him to stay out of the public eye anyway. He's also not on social media, but I am. So go check me out because I'm posting toxic programmer content there. But seriously, follow me. I'm trying to get to 10K so girls will respond to my messages. Bottom line, even if TK is a villain, you have to agree. Building a company to 50 billion in three years is no joke. With that said, hope you like these documentary videos. See you in the next one.